But to see, see Zdenka here today, oh, well, that's living, lovely. breathing, well, you've had a wonderful life, yes. married, a daughter, two grandchildren. Yes. And Who knows? Maybe life. some great grandchildren in the not too distant future. Maybe. We Maybe. can but hope. And I have to thank you and your country. <laughs> Let's send you. Yes, that's lovely meeting. Yeah. To really save our yes. life. To liberate us, because if it wasn't for you, oh, no, yes, I it, wouldn't be here. It's a pleasure to have met you. It <laughs> really is. May you live many, many more years. And you. <laughs> Thank you. Bringing George and Denka together was a really remarkable event, which, to be honest, I felt honoured to be there. And it's wonderful to have given George at least some peace of mind all these years later. And as for Zdenka, well, she finally had the chance to say those two words she'd wanted to for so long. Thank you. See you next time on Antiques Roadshow Detectives. Wednesday evening on BBC Two, and coming up next, Collectaholics. Everything from computers to fossils. A collection of teddy bears needs close inspection too. They're actually infested with moths. Pest detectives set to work at eight. On any other day, this may seem a bit odd. But on the 26th of April, it's heroic. From the funniest to the fastest, they're all heroes to us. The London Marathon, Sunday the 26th of April, across the BBC. Three brand new series come to BBC Two. This is a real interview process. Delicious. With the biggest prize in gardening. You're in with the big boys and there isn't any space for mistakes. Chelsea is only a short step away now. And the secrets behind making our favourite foods. We're making 55,000 chocolates an hour. Let them feel the heat while you chill out. Tools down, time is up. Make a date for eight every Monday to Thursday, starting with Alex Polizzi, Chefs on Trial, Monday at eight on BBC Two. And at eight tonight, our pest detectives are out in force. No flies on them. After Collectaholics. From puppets. To CDs. Royalty. To arcades. Drums. To Pokemon. We are a nation of collectors. Oh, my goodness. Join me, Mark Hill. As an antiques expert and lifelong collector, I love uncovering hidden gems. Quite incredible. Unbelievable. And me, Jasmine Harmon. Oh! As the daughter of a hoarder, I know just how things can get out of hand. This is bonkers! And I'm going to use my experience to help people manage their collections. So there are shelving units behind the shelving unit? Yes. Together, we'll find out what makes our collectors tick. I feel they're an extension of my family, the royal family. Keeping it in order stops me becoming anxious. And reveal what the collections are really worth. You could pretty much name your price for that. Sounds good to me. My God. Well, I didn't expect that. Come with us and discover what lies behind Britain's closed doors. <laughs> Tonight. It looks like bangs of some kind, doesn't it? We meet the man with the oldest collection we've ever seen. This is um, around 200 million years old. I can't get my head around it. He's under pressure to sell, but will he give in to temptation? So you're telling me that this is the most valuable thing in your shop and it's not for sale? Yeah. I meet the Edwardian enthusiast who brings the past back to life. It's an obsession. It has sort of overtaken my life, really, in that sense. But just how easy is it to get the authentic look? Effectively, you're bringing 21st century technology right back to the Edwardian period. And I meet the man who's plugged into prehistoric PCs. <gasps> oh, my goodness, look at these. But can we reboot his extensive collection? So, moment of truth. <laughs> 
I've come to Nottinghamshire to meet a collector who has an unusual addiction to the past. I think I collect because it's that sort of obsessive part of my personality. I go from one extreme to another. I'm all or nothing. 35-year-old Peter works for the local council. But when he's off duty, he spends his time renovating his cottage, taking it back to another era. I want to get it back to the point of what it really was about 100 years from now. It's an homage to an early 20th century working class cottage. It's given me a, a kind of a purpose in life, really. Um, so it is part of me now. I can't wait to see just how accurate Peter's snapshot of the past is. Peter, hello. Hello Hi, there. Nice to meet you. you want to come this way, Mark? Oh, my goodness me. You need to call Cher. <laughs> Cher? <laughs> You've proven you can turn back time. This is absolutely incredible. Peter's renovated its entire contents. The parlour, the living kitchen, the bathroom, the master bedroom where he sleeps, and the replica children's bedroom. Even the outside lavatory is fitting of the time. Most rooms are in a period style, around okay. the sort of First World War period. Why that period? <sighs> I quite like that First World War period because it's on the cusp, isn't it, of Art Deco, with Edwardian, it's sort of a bit of a mix of both. And Peter's meticulous attention to detail doesn't come cheap. So how much have you spent on doing a room like this? I've lost track, to be honest with you. Um, thousands, thousands. This was a man in love with Marilyn Monroe memorabilia. But when he purchased a late 19th century house, his collecting changed from Hollywood glamour to the austerity of the Great War period. Now he's a strict slave to the era and the social standing of the cottage. It really has to be what the people in this house could afford, whether it be wallpaper, decor. Once I got the gas lights, I wanted, then I wanted the rag rugs, then I wanted the Staffordshire ornaments. It just become a compulsion. This is the sort of crockery that one might expect to see in a house like this. It's nothing fancy, it's not fine porcelain. It's good old Staffordshire transfer printed ware. That's right, but it did have a bit of a gold rim on it. They had aspirations, these people. Yes, it was bling on a budget. <laughs> it's Peter's Edwardian parlour that really impresses. Right, this is the best room, the parlour. Good Lord, it really is the best room, isn't it? Better furniture. Fancy lights. Fancy lights. And that fantastic amount of Victorian knick-knackery. The things that we hate these days, chuck out your chintz, we were told. Look at it all. I also quite like these sort of souvenir plates. I have to say, they are probably one of the things I really least like in the house. They are ghastly, but <laughs> it's very likely the people in this house would have had them. You're a sort of martyr to detail, aren't you? You say you don't like those, but because they fit the house, you've got to have them. I sometimes feel like I have to apologise. <laughs> And it seems Peter will go to unbelievable lengths in his quest for the authentic. OK, then, Mark, <laughs> this is, um... Welcome to even more madness, let's say. Well, I didn't expect this. This is a shop. It's absolutely incredible. It's a fully fitted reincarnation of the 1920s grocer's shop that used to be here, sitting in what should be Peter's living room. I tell you what, out of anything in the house, this was the most addictive of all. Um, I went to auctions, you know, and I'd go everywhere and anywhere in a hope of finding that one tin. I mean, you've gone quite a long way down. You haven't just collected the advertising. You've got the till, you've got the scales, you've got the jars. You could open up shop, couldn't you, if you wanted to? <laughs> I could do, except there's not much food in these stuff. <laughs> <laughs> if there was, I don't think I'd want to eat it. <laughs> In 1920, this shop would have been the heart of the community, with local visitors not only coming in for their groceries, but for a good old natter too. 74-year-old Roy used to shop here in the 40s and 50s. So you oh. remember this as, as a child? Oh, yes. He used to just call in here to get them sweets. How, how good a job has Peter done? I think he's done a superb job. 
and the recreation is marvellous. I mean, it's great that people like Roy appreciate what I'm doing, um, and it makes it all worthwhile, while really, because at the end of the day, you know, I'm not just doing it for my benefits, you know, there's, it's great that people are enjoying it and, and see the worth in what we're doing and the fact that it's celebrating of times gone by. The shop was boarded up in the late 60s when the owner became ill. But what's driven Peter to reinstate it with such loving care? Excuse me if I, I, I can say this, but you seem quite obsessive. I mean, there's a certain sort of fanaticism about all of this. It's almost an addiction for you. It is. It's an obsession. Getting my eye in, trying to work out what would have been in this house. It has sort of overtaken my life, really, in that sense. So it's all or nothing, really, for you. You go and find out what it is you're looking for, and you have to have that object. I do, yeah. It is very much all or nothing. It's taken Peter 11 years to renovate every room in his home. You do become a bit of a sort of a, a detective, really, um, to try to find clues of what was there in the past. Right, then, this is the second bedroom, children's bedroom. Although I haven't got wow. children. And his next assignment is his most extravagant. I'm looking to recreate the wallpaper in the second bedroom, which I've found a trace of in a cupboard. I just feel I have to have it. When I was decorating the inside of this airing cupboard, I noticed behind this architrave here, because there's a gap, I could feel wallpaper and I just pulled it out and I found this beauty. That's amazing. So more detective work. It's Ooh. very delicate. It is. It is very delicate, very floral, very dainty. I do want to get this reproduced at some point. This type of floral print was all the rage in Edwardian times. The light and cheerful patterns replaced the dark, ostentatious clutter of the Victorian period. But you've still got some work to do, haven't you, on uh, turning this into an entire room of wallpaper? I think there's going to be a bit of artistic licence, but you can see it's quite repetitive. You know, you just need a little square like that, and then I think that would be able to replicate the whole thing from that. You can just get a graphic designer to work it up. Effectively, you're bringing 21st century technology right back to the Edwardian period to allow it to live again. That's right. It's clear that Peter will stop at nothing for museum-like accuracy, and I can't help but wonder if we can find a way for him to make some money to fund his collection. I've come to East Yorkshire to see a collection that to some might not be the prettiest, but for our collector, it's been his passion for over 25 years. I'm interested in machines and things that go whir, you know, and anything goes round or, you know, make, makes a noise or whatever, it's, it's interesting. 55-year-old Jim is a professor of neural computation and he collects obsolete computers, most of which don't even switch on. It's a bit of a crazy passion, you know, you, you, just, you just get hooked. Because um, every new machine that comes through the door, you know, wow, you know, look at the size of it, look what it's got in it. It's got that sort of processor. And also just the look of them, they look great. Smart, really sexy. Hi. Hello, Jim. Jasmine. Nice to meet you. Jim's collection is stored in four outbuildings, but these aren't your average garden sheds. So these are the sheds. <laughs> this is all given over to your collection? Yep, all of it. It's no wonder you don't have it in the house. It wouldn't fit in the house. Yeah. Wow. This is quite a setup you've got here, isn't it? Oh my goodness, look at these. Jim's collection started in 1986 and represents computer development over the last hundred years. Being in academia, you know, you can, you can be seen as being a bit bonkers. So I didn't tell anybody about the collection for years and years and years. I just collected it quietly because I knew it was a bit odd. He has over 1,000 computers in his collection, including this one that was donated by a nuclear power station. So, yeah, this is designed in about 1959 in Wilver Nuclear Power Station, looking after the nuclear power station. And it ran from 1966 to 2003 non-stop. Possibly one of the longest running computers. The mind begins to really boggle when you think that this 
monitored a nuclear power station for all those years, and yet it's probably less powerful than... A watch. A watch. <laughs> really? Yeah. Jim has the largest private collection of historic computers in the UK, but his passion began when he was just a child. I'm, I'm dyslexic. Um, which uh, was a problem at school. And my mother was told that get him interested in something. So there was an old radio in the, in the cupboard at home, and so I took it out of the bottom of the cupboard and took it all apart, saying I was going to fix it. And I, I chopped all the components out, put them in neat little piles, and that was it. It never worked again, but I was hooked. By the age of 17, Jim had built his first computer, and he's continued to achieve great things. I'm a professor of neural computation, so I'm known for neural networks, which is basically how do you make computers work like the brain works. Computers have been central to what I've been doing all my life. So this is the cool computer. This is my everyday job, is designing new machines like this. So you built this? Yeah. You know how hard it is to add memory to your computer? Mm. Well, there's this. You just do that. Ah, you want to add a fantastic. bit more memory? Another, <laughs> another processor? So what is the idea behind this? Make computers better. We find new ways of building them. Do you think having this collection and exploring these old computers has helped you to invent it, it something is, like this? It is a direct result of the collection. One of the most impressive rooms is the one that's home to Jim's supercomputers. This looks like where you keep all the monsters, yeah, all the beasts. Yeah, this is our machine room. Supercomputers were introduced in the 1960s and are the fastest type of computer. They're used for very specialised applications that require immense amounts of mathematical calculations, such as weather forecasting and nuclear energy research. This is one computer? Yeah, so it's about 22 years old. Oh my goodness. It was a, a national supercomputer, it's the, the most powerful computer you can get, basically, really? at the time. Weighs about five tonnes. Five tonnes? Yeah. But your average smartphone, a hundred times the power of this machine. You could have a hundred of these in your pocket. <laughs> yeah, you do. Basically. You do. And it cost um, about two and a half million. But the amazing thing was, I worked out it worked, de depreciated at £16,000 a week. Oh, no. <laughs> these computers were the cutting edge of technology in their day, but are now out of date and would have ended up on the scrap heap had it not been for Jim. This one was probably used for oh, sort of chemistry and that sort of thing, you know, for working out new molecules for drugs, that sort of thing. The great thing about this machine is the button at the top. Right, that just looks like, imagine somebody... Well, it's a reset, it? it is a reset button. It's a reset button? Yeah, so what people used to do is, 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 is to come and say, well, how's the computer going? <laughs> <laughs> and that would uh, switch it off. Yeah, switch it off. So what they did is they made little again. protectors for them. Ah. Out of drain pipe. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so that people wouldn't accidentally reset your computer right in the middle of it's your really important work. Oh, it's just wonderful, isn't it? It's taken Jim a quarter of a century to amass over a thousand computers, but he's now starting to worry about their future. I have Parkinson's disease as well, um, diagnosed about four years ago. My consultant for my Parkinson's disease says, some people said it's the best thing that's ever happened to him. And I thought, what best thing that ever happened to them? How can that be? But I can see why, because you basically sit back and say, right, I'm going to focus on the things I really am passionate about, because, you know, you never know how long you got, sort of thing. So it's the computer collection and my research. Jim is finding it harder to manage his growing collection, so a few of his friends who also share his passion help out. Jim tells me that you guys are his shedders. That's shedders, what he calls yeah. you. Yeah, right. yes, <laughs> is that right? Yes, yes. So what, what's the idea behind it? Why do you guys come down here? As you can see, there's rather a lot of stuff here and it takes quite a bit of work to move everything around and organise it all and hopefully get some of it going. We've, uh, we've not had all that much luck with that, but we're trying. <laughs> Everybody has to be a little bit daft, I think, to come and do this, but it's good fun. And, you know, who could throw away this equipment? It's beautiful. I mean, guys, convince me. Isn't this just a load of old, defunct, out-of-date technology? 
well, if you can imagine when um, steam engines were being phased out and everything was moving over to diesel, then people would think, oh, these things are huge, they're useless, and we'll just get rid of them all. But then look at all the heritage steam railways that are going now and people restoring the engines. It's exactly the same thing. Jim would love more people to be able to enjoy and appreciate the collection and hopes that one day it will be open to the public. The idea is to, to not so much open it as a museum, but as a learning centre. People can come along and see you know, what's happening, get inspired by it and create the next generations of computing. So in a way, the main idea behind this collection or the future of this collection is to get as many people benefiting from it, accessing it, learning from it, enjoying it. Yeah, that would be fantastic. Really, really good. I want to help Jim throw open the doors to his hidden collection and see if we can get him the recognition he deserves. Jim may have a passion for our modern past, but we've come to Lyme Regis in Dorset to meet a man with a predilection for the prehistoric. I love it. I absolutely love my collection. Half of it is the hunts, you know, just, just, just looking for the things and the anticipation. Meet fossil collector Paddy, who trawls the local beaches searching for rocks that might turn out to be fossils. I, I would say it, it is an addiction. There's a real buzz and every time you hit a stone, it could be just the best thing you've ever seen. It might be something new to science, it might be something beautiful uh, and you just don't know. Hi. 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 How are you? Nice to meet you. Hi. Oh. oh my wow. Goodness. It's a treasure trove. You've got some really beautiful things. It's like a sort of Victorian sort of den in here. It, it, it is, yeah. It's a yeah, Victorian man cave. Yeah, I don't really know how many fossils I've got. Um, I've long since lost count, but thousands probably. It's over 40 years of going out in all conditions. Almost everything here Paddy has found, brought home, cracked open and prepared himself. His collection holds some stunning examples of 300 million year old carboniferous plants, as well as several examples of the ichthyosaur, the 200 million year old reptile that resembles the dolphin. I can see something amazing there that's broken it's in like half. It's like a jaw, by It looks it. like a fangs of some kind, doesn't it? What's that? This is part of the jaw uh, of a large ichthyosaur. So these are, all, ah. these are all teeth. These are marine reptiles, which evolved from land living reptiles. So they've gone back to the water. So how big was this when it was alive? This animal was probably around six metres in length. This is really just the tip of the snout. Wow. Paddy found his ichthyosaur on his local Lyme Regis beach, where he also found examples of a more common curiosity, the ammonite, an extinct marine animal identified by its spiral shell. What causes that amazing iridescence, or is that something you apply? It's the mother of pearl from the inside of the shell. Good heavens. Um, the, the colours are entirely, entirely natural. So how long has that lasted? How old is that? Uh, this is around 200 million years old. 200 million year old colour. I can't get my head around it. So this is obviously a prized possession, but what's inside the drawers underneath All here? All these drawers are full of, uh, full of things. Um, so this one, oh. more ammonites. How many have you got? I don't know. <laughs> uh, Could you hazard hundreds, a guess? Um, hundreds, and I don't even really collect ammonites. I really collect. Oh really? You could have told me. I really collect fossil bones. <laughs> yeah. And and this is all stuff you've found just locally along the coast Mostly, here. Yeah. With an unlimited supply of fossils on Dorset beaches there could be no end to Paddy's collecting. I would describe Paddy's collection as growing constantly. Yeah, I remember a time when my entire collection fitted in a small wooden box, uh, and now I have individual, individual bones that wouldn't even fit in that box. I mean, it's amazing. How long have you been collecting? Uh, my mother brought me here on a day trip when I was six years old. So, <gasps> really? Yeah, on and off, 43 years. 
Do you know exactly what you've got here? Do you know everything? No, you forget. You know, I've got so much. Like, you might open a drawer and think, oh, my, you know, I'd forgotten completely that I'd found that at all. Paddy's collection is years of hard work. Finding the fossil is only the first part of the collector's job. Uh, this one's quite a, quite a nice object. A whole mass wow! of ammonites all gathered together. And how do you expose these? I mean, you must have to be so precise. Um, yeah, we use uh, um, uh, various power tools to, uh, to remove the stone. This has taken 27 hours so far, but it's not finished. Um, I shall go down in between these ammonites. It's about probably another 10 hours work. When the rocks are brought home, they look quite ordinary. Special chiseling tools then painstakingly scrape away the stone to reveal the fossil. At every stage, there's a risk of shattering the specimen, and the process can take months. Finding them is the easy bit. Preparing them, you know, just getting them off the beach, you know, that's, that's really hard work sometimes. So you consider yourself a professional collector? Uh, kind of semi-professional, I suppose, yeah. Um, you know, uh, a professional collector probably wouldn't have kept as many things as I have, you know, they, they, they'd be selling those things. So it's not just about money for you? No, not at all, no. Uh, I didn't get into this for, for the money at all. Um, and, you know, life's too short not to do stuff you love doing. So Paddy's in it for the science and not the money. But wife Ricky wishes his hobby was better at paying its way. It's probably best I don't know the value of the collection because I think as a non-collector, I would see what I could do with that if it was sold. I would see a new family car or a shoes for the kids or, or a family holiday. Um, but Paddy doesn't see that. Today, Paddy's taking me to his favourite beach to find even more fossils. Yeah, welcome to my office. <laughs> <laughs> this is where you work every day. Uh, yeah, most days or a lot of days. Um, oh, it could be worse, couldn't it? Uh, could do with a, a toilet and a coffee machine, but otherwise good. So yeah. where are we heading? There's an area of beach further over there. It's that brighter area. Oh, yeah. And there's a big mud flow at the end of that. So I guarantee fossils of some sort. <laughs> but, uh, you guarantee? Yeah, you'll find fossils. Excellent. Shall we wander over? OK. There's a reason why Paddy has made his home at Lyme Regis. We're right in the heart of the Jurassic Coast, where changing sea levels exposes millions of years of geological history. Perfect for fossil hunting. And that's a, it's a Cretaceous rock at the top of the cliff uh, that gives you that golden colour. 200 years ago, Mary Anning, the greatest fossil hunter in Britain's history, discovered the world's very first examples of ichthyosaur and plesiosaur fossils on this very same beach. Following in Mary Anning's footsteps, it isn't long before Paddy finds something. Oh, now look. Oh, now what? So, yeah, just there in the mud. Oh, yes. Another little ammonite. That tiny little... That tiny little thing. That circle there. Yeah. This little ammonite could have been waiting for us on the beach for over 200 million years. I can see how difficult it must be to find some of those absolutely spectacular specimens that you've got. People say, oh, you've got all these so many wonderful things, but you know, that's, that's 43 years of looking, you know, that, that, that wasn't all in the last six months. You know, it's taken an awful long time to find those things. Once again, Paddy spots something. Actually, there's a, here, a light grey, very smooth limestone. Smooth, yeah. I can see bits of ammonite on that side. Oh. Oh, wow. That's not too shabby. Oh, how lovely. You just knew, didn't you? Have you got X-ray vision? No, it's just, uh, just practice, just recognising the right sort of stone, the ones which are likely to have something inside. We are the only two people on the planet who have seen that. Oh, nobody wow! Else, nobody can have seen that. You know, it's 190 million years old and it's been locked away for all that time. Fossil collecting is time-consuming and Paddy needs to earn a living. While wife Ricky has a teddy bear hospital, Paddy runs a small fossil shop underneath. Wow, it's an Aladdin's cave in here. 
Yeah, there's uh, one or two fossils around the place. Just looking around and just noticing some of the prices, and they're for something that's hundreds of millions of years old, incredibly inexpensive. Six pounds, 12 pounds, 15 pounds. I mean, not quite pocket money prices, but not far off it. Yeah, I mean, we do have, you know, we have things for kids, you know, one or two pounds, things like that. Uh, and again, it's something for every budget. You've become a professional dealer. I mean, this is, this is what you do. Yeah, it's one of the things I do. Um, I'm, I'm no businessman, <laughs> so it's, it's, uh, it's not highly profitable, really. Does Paddy manage to make a living from his fossils? The shop is just another room to collect fossils and it's kind of almost like a fossil, it's the fossil hunters club kind of thing and lots of fossil hunters congregate and talk fossils and he's not very good, it took about a year to get him to get a business card and a phone line. And so really for there. him he's not, he's, he's not never going to business be a businessman man. though. It seems Paddy's a better fossil hunter than a shopkeeper. But I can't avoid not asking you about that. Okay. That's fabulous. Well, that's, uh, that's most of the, the skeleton of an ichthyosaur. Uh, that's one that I found in, in 2001. So, if I wanted to buy that, what would I have to pay to own that? You would be looking probably somewhere at uh, six or seven thousand pounds. Good lord. Now, at least two guys have tried to buy that off me. Tried to buy it? Yeah, I, I, I turned them both down. So, you're telling me that this is the most valuable thing in your shop and it's not for sale? Yeah. For any money. But what about the less rare fossils that could be sold? What would be really nice if it, maybe the, the bottom third of his collection he could sell and then some of that money could go towards a holiday or a car. <laughs> yeah. And um, Are these things that you've had to go without? Oh, we've never been away on holiday. We've never been abroad on holiday. Ricky would love Paddy to convert some of his collection to cash, so I want to find out how much they're worth to see if it might be enough to tempt him. While Paddy's clinging on to his collection, Peter's been expanding his. It's been two months since I visited his picture-perfect Edwardian-era home, and boy, has he been busy. He's managed to commission a specialist company to produce a replica of the wallpaper once adorning the spare bedroom from just a 10-inch sample. Peter's devoted himself to the interior design of one particular era, but I've come to Bexley Heath to discover the man who set the tone for interior design in the 19th century. The average British home at this time was plain and functional. Then William Morris came along and it all changed. He saw beauty in everything, a return to craftsmanship, and here at the Red House is where it began. Jan Marsh is the president of the William Morris Society. Well, welcome Hello. to Red House. Nice Thanks to meet you. Thanks for having me. You must be Jan. I am. I'm Jasmine. I'm... Wow. <laughs> It's pretty impressive, isn't it? <laughs> Absolutely. By today's standard, you'd fit two bedrooms and a bathroom in this hallway, wouldn't you? <laughs> a young William Morris commissioned the Red House to be built, moved in with his wife Janie in 1860, and unable to find the decor he liked, he set about designing his own. He was a very wealthy young man. He was only 25. You must think of this house. 25? As, as a, what a house for a 25-year-old. So he could indulge his passions, whatever they were. And at this moment, it was for building and decorating this house. Assisted by his band of friends, the pre-Raphaelite circle, he hosted many a party where they transformed his home and gave birth to a new industry of interior design. And they all came with their wives and girlfriends, and they were all set to work decorating really? and painting, yes. So they had sort of the equivalent to now, we would say, right, let's have a painting party, we need to decorate the house. It was such a fun place to be. Much of the decor was inspired by medieval tapestries and paintings. Goodness me, look at this! Wow. This is one of Morris's early murals, where the repeated pattern influenced his later iconic wallpaper. Is it paint then? It is, it's, it's stenciled on, but I painted. It's wallpaper. Um, and there's a little hidden smiley face up here, you, which you won't believe if you look right up behind the rafters. Oh, yes! <laughs> oh, how funny. <laughs> Somebody was having a bit of a laugh. Obviously. <laughs> 
We take DIY decoration for granted today, but it was Morris that really brought it to the masses. Why is Red House so important? It was here that the Morris firm, with all the, all the products, was actually conceived. It was um, the group of, of friends were here um, in a cold January uh, weekend, and Morris, who always having a new idea, said to himself, well, I can't find the furniture or the furnishings that we need for this Red House. Why don't we start making them ourselves? Is that how it happened? <laughs> Absolutely. And off he rushed and he set up the firm within four weeks. Wow, so it was actually having this house mm. that inspired him. Absolutely. His do-it-yourself approach kick-started the Morris style, which exploded onto the market, becoming all the rage with the middle and upper classes. And by the end of the 19th century, arts and crafts design was a dominant style in Britain very many wealthy and middle-class people then began to furnish their homes and decorate their homes in with Morris fabrics and designs and then of course uh, Morris designs had a revival in the 1960s and 70s and a lot of people today actually grew up with wallpapers and curtains Jan thank you so much for showing me around and sharing all your knowledge about William Morris with me it's a very great pleasure Jasmine this house gives such a fabulous insight into the life, personality and philosophy of William Morris. He started a movement which not only changed the way people decorated their homes, but also the way they lived in them. Since William Morris, we have been obsessed with the look of our homes, and there's no better example than our Edwardian collector, Peter and I've come to his turn-of-the-century home to see for myself how he's turned back time. He's finished hanging the wallpaper he got reproduced from a 10-inch sample. Hi. Hello. Are you Peter? I am. You want to be Jasmine? Nice to meet you. <laughs> I can't <laughs> believe it. This is amazing. This project has been two months in the making and I can't wait to see the end result. Right, Jasmine, this is the wallpaper. This is the famous wallpaper. Yes. <gasps> really lovely. Thank you. This is the original scrap oh. that has been cleaned up, and that's all he had to base this on. Wow. That's Can brilliant, yeah. I really have achieved my mission of getting it back to 1920, so I don't think I could ask for any more. It's incredible to think that Peter has recreated a room that would be familiar to the people using it a century ago. That's, Was it worth it? I know it is crazy, but I just felt like it, I just needed to do it. You know, otherwise I would have picked a wallpaper that was like it. It just wouldn't have been right and it would have niggled at me. Like, <laughs> well, I hope you don't mind, but we have had an idea that might help you to fund more wallpaper if needed or other additions. Sounds good to me. Interested? Very. Come I've asked along Tim Beasley from UK Film Location, who may have an interesting proposition that could put Peter's collection in the spotlight. Hi, Tim. Hi. Nice How to are you? see you. Yeah, good. This is Peter. Hi, Peter. Hi there. Whose home we're in. Isn't it fantastic? What a great place. Tim is a location scout. All oh, right. <laughs> How would you feel about letting Tim go and have a look around? Yeah, I'd be very interested to see what he thinks. Yeah, yeah fantastic. Thank you. Oh, wow. Tim sources shooting locations for his clients from across the country. Goodness. Well, this is amazing. What do you think of the idea? I've always been interested in, obviously, renting it out. But I always thought, if you're not London-based, that kind of limits mm. location companies wanting to film in places like this. I wonder whether Peter's home has ticked any boxes for Tim. So, Tim, what do you think? Well, I think this is a fantastic property. The decor, the styling, the detail you've gone into. Is it quite unusual to see a property that's set out like this? Oh, most definitely. Have you got yeah. anything else like this on no, your books? No, no. Um, the nearest thing to it would be a museum, and a museum is not a family home. This property has uh, very big appeal. 
what sort of money we're talking. <laughs> yeah, let's get to the bottom line here. <laughs> we would expect stills would be at the bottom range, probably £300 a day, up to commercials, which would be probably in the region £2,500 a day. It's not bad, is it? <laughs> Two and a half thousand pounds a day. I'm out the door now. <laughs> that's, a, that's a whole lot of wallpaper. Mm. I think this is a unique property, and I think we have every opportunity of securing your shoots. Well, I, I've always hoped there'd be something extra, just to get something back from it, really. Let's see what happens. And uh, Peter done a major job. It's been absolutely brilliant. <laughs> I don't know what to say. <laughs> What a joy to see Peter's home. Such attention to detail and authenticity, and it looks like his efforts could pay off, enabling him to earn some cash from his passion, which he can then reinvest into his collection. While one collection could be getting its time in the limelight, another is up for an audition. Computer collector Jim is also keen for his efforts to be shared and enjoyed by others. But far from their many and varied uses today, decades ago they were changing British history. I've come to the National Museum of Computing in Milton Keynes to discover more. The story behind one of the world's first electronic computers is one of intrigue, true British determination and ingenuity. A machine shrouded in secrecy for decades. This is Colossus. A machine that helped change the destiny of World War II and mankind. The year was 1940. Allied listening stations were picking up radio chatter from across Europe. Hitler's famous encryption machine, the Enigma, had been triumphantly broken by Alan Turing and his colleagues. So now we were able to decipher the cryptic messages sent between troops across the continent. But we weren't able to decipher the codes Hitler used to communicate with his inner circle, produced from a machine known as Lorenz. The challenge facing mathematicians at Bletchley was to break a code with a staggering 1.6 million billion possibilities. And unsurprisingly, initially they were stumped. With each message being individually encrypted, it was thought the code couldn't be cracked. But eventually the British got a lucky break. A German message using one of the uncracked codes was sent twice. The second message used abbreviations. However, the German operator sending the messages slipped up and failed to change the encryption setting. British codebreakers compared the abbreviations with the original message and, within a couple of months, mathematician Bill Tutt had established just how the Lorenz machine was encoding them. Now Britain could decipher communications sent by Hitler's high command, but there was another problem. By the time they deciphered the messages, the events had been and gone. The breakthrough would come from an unlikely candidate, an engineer and electronics whiz called Tommy Flowers. The son of a bricklayer from Poplar, he had been working as a general post office engineer in one of their research centres since 1930. But underneath all that rough and readiness was one of the greatest men in British history and one who had helped turn the fortunes of the war. Flowers suggested building an electronic machine that used 1,500 valves to decode thousands of characters every second. But previous devices using valves had been unreliable, often breaking down. No one had ever used so many and no one thought it would work. Flowers was convinced and stuck to his guns. He spent the next 11 months with his engineers building the world's first electronic, digital, programmable computer. No one had seen anything like it. They dubbed it Colossus. The machine did the job and by the end of the war, the British had 10 in operation, which gave them an ear on Hitler and his most trusted advisers and was thought to have shortened the war by two years. You're not alone if you've never heard of Colossus. 
Revealing the achievements of people like Tommy Flowers was deemed a security threat. It's only in recent years that declassified war documents have revealed the truth. The huge debt owed to these heroic mathematicians and engineers. Tommy Flowers received little recognition. But he should be remembered not only as the man who built one of the world's first computers, but also as the man who rose to the challenge to save his nation in its hour of greatest need. Back in East Yorkshire, I'm helping Jim find a way to help others appreciate his passion for obsolete computers, which have so far gone unnoticed. We're hosting an open house, or should that be an open shed? I know you were quite nervous about having lots of people in here and touching your precious computers, but when I was chatting to your shedders, all of you would really like this collection to be more accessible. Yeah, it would be, be great to do that. I mean, uh, what we've been trying to do is to set it up so we can start to see what's possible. You know, museums are great, but what we want to do is produce the next set of people that can develop machines like this, you know, push forward and by coming here and having a look at the machines, they can learn about them and go, yeah, yeah, I can do this. Our first guests are a group of computer science students from the local university, along with their lecturer, Dr Chris Bailey. What do you think of this, seeing all these old computers? I mean, it's fantastic to see uh, Moore's Law in action. Moore's Law? Uh, What's the, that? The doubling of the, the number of transistors on a, a chip every 18 months. So that's how we have the same amount of uh, computing power in our iPhones today that we have on these big mainframes from decades ago. So Jim and his friends have put together a challenge for you all. You up for it? We'll give it a <laughs> try. Excellent, well, follow me. As I lead them through this TARDIS of technology, Jim has a surprise waiting that will hopefully get the votes of his first visitors. That is, is the machine that Maggie Thatcher's election results were calculated on. This actual machine? That actual machine predicted the outcome of the election more accurately than anybody else. That's quite exciting, isn't it? So what we're going to try and do today is to try and restore these two machines. Neither of them work at present. So what we'd like you guys to do is to try and get one of the machines to work and then we will use that as a basis to restore the other one so eventually we'll have both machines properly restored. Feeling confident? <laughs> well, good luck guys. Do you think coming here today and having a task like this is going to be beneficial to your students? The opportunity to take apart a computer, or put it back together in this case hopefully, is something that you don't tend to do very much. These days we have laptops and smartphones, it's not the sort of thing you take apart. Getting to look inside a computer is more of a rarity. So is this a bit of a treat for them today? Yeah, I think so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And these switches tell you what the base address is of each card. OK. And that's set in a binary. Tomorrow's computer whiz kids are loving this hands-on access to these old machines. But I've also invited along another group of tech fanatics that might actually be able to enlighten Jim on some parts of his collection. Hi, Jim. Hi. I've brought some people to oh, meet you. Hello. They are Jim. from the Computer <laughs> Conservation Society. Britain's largest group of computer history enthusiasts are volunteers that spend their time preserving old computers, much like the ones that Jim owns. What is the value in preserving these old technologies? Well, all this represents the second industrial revolution. They're so easy to throw away when they become obsolete and a new version comes. Mm -hmm. So it's absolutely vital that this technology and the way things were done only 50 or 60 or 70 years ago are preserved. So are you all feeling quite excited about what you might uncover walking around oh, here? Definitely, yes. Do you want to go and explore and then we'll see you afterwards? With over 1,000 uncatalogued items to process, it'll be interesting to see what they make of the collection and see if they can shed some light on other ways to make it more accessible. It's astonishing. It's so huge. One could spend weeks and weeks examining everything and saying, ooh, ah, oh, I remember that. <laughs> to my mind, you could have a selection of your machines publicly visible in timeline kind of display, mm -hmm. easily assimilated, plenty of graphics, mm -hmm. and that would tell the 
the overall uh, story of the computer. I, I like the idea of a timeline. That, that worked yeah. very well. Is it nice to have people here who really appreciate and it's understand your collection, unlike people <laughs> like me? Better to see people like you come because prior to coming you knew nothing about this sort of thing. You're learning about it for the first time and doing what the collection's aiming to do, which is to, you know, make you aware of the history of computing. Jim's own history-defining computer has now been overhauled by the visiting students and Jim's friends. But has this new open house experience been worth it? So, moment of truth. Ooh, sounds positive. Do you like to press the light that says load? Me? Yes. Do I get do I get to press it? <laughs> it starts up. I'll leave it start spinning. <laughs> Stand back. <laughs> What's gonna happen? Is that it? Is that is that it's working? Wait for the screen. Oh, Hey! Whoa. Wow! Come on! Everyone, well done! Fantastic, isn't it? That's amazing! It's great, isn't it? <laughs> Wonderful to see them working again. There's life in the old dog yet! <laughs> wow! This is the first time Jim's computer has worked for around 15 years. It's fantastic because we've got very few machines working at all, so to have one actually operating and the lights flashing, absolutely brilliant. The question is, though, will I be able to send an email on this? Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> Brings it to life when people come here and you know, look at everything. It makes you want to do more of it. Inspire people and, you know, even, even people who don't know much about it. It's fantastic. I know Jim wants as many people involved with his collection as possible. I think what he has here could be a fantastic learning tool and an innovative way for people of all ages to connect with technology. Back in Lyme Regis, Paddy's under pressure to sell some of his collection. So I've invited Errol Fuller, extinct animal expert, to take a look. So what jumps out at you? Well, down here, mm -hmm. there's a whole range of, of ammonites, and there's one in particular that's very iridescent and beautiful. Beauty is one thing, mm -hmm. but let's get down to pounds, shillings and pence. What's that worth? <sighs> I should think about 150 pounds, something okay. like that. What else jumps out at you? Is that what I think it is? Let me look. You tell me what you think it is. That's part of a Scylidosaurus. That is really interesting because that is the only dinosaur that's found in, in, in the Lyme Regis area. This fossil Paddy didn't find, but bought from another collector for £150. It was only after he had it dipped in acid that Paddy realised it was part of a Scalidosaur, a dinosaur only found in Dorset. So it's rare, it's important, but is it valuable? Probably in the... 10, 15, but it might go for a lot more. 10 or 15,000 yeah, pounds. Yeah. Might go for a lot more. The fossils in Paddy's collection are worth anything from a few pounds to thousands. But one thing's for sure, he definitely won't be parting with his rare and valuable ones. They're more likely to find their way into museums like this. I've been given a very special treat. I'm here at London's Natural History Museum before the doors are even open to the thronging public for a sneak peek behind the scenes and to find out what these relics have to teach us. This museum first opened in 1881, offering the British public a national collection specialising in life on Earth. The museum's founder, Richard Owen, was the first to recognise that some fossilised remains must come from a distinct group of prehistoric animals, which he called dinosaur, meaning terrible reptile. This is Sophie. Unveiled just weeks ago, she's the first complete dinosaur specimen to be exhibited at the Natural History Museum for nearly a hundred years. Researchers will be studying Sophie to uncover the secrets behind her evolution. 
In fact, the Natural History Museum employs 300 scientists to analyse some 80 million specimens, 8 million of which are fossils, giving a unique insight into the history of life on the planet and helping us plan for future environmental change. Nice right. to meet you. Hi. Hi. Come on in. Thank you. Dr Lorna Steele is a fossil curator. We're now in the dinosaur collection in the bowels of the building Ooh. and you're looking at some of the larger specimens, dinosaur leg bones and here's a hadrosaur tail. Why is it important, do you think, to keep studying these fossils? Well, fossils tell us about life and conditions on the planet a long time ago and we're facing changing conditions on the planet today. So one of the useful things we can do is to look back into the past, see how quickly have things changed and what happens to those animals and plants when those changes happen. And there's another specimen Lorna's dying to show me. Ooh. <laughs> My favourite specimen in the collection. Really? Yeah, this is my favourite. <gasps> oh, my goodness! Look at those teeth! I know, it's terrifying. The total body length for this animal was something like 11 metres. That is unbelievable. But that's a conservative estimate. The highest estimates for the body length are 18 metres. Oh! <laughs> But it isn't just the evolution of life on Earth that fossils like this one teach us. And if you could just give me a little hand with of this. Of course, yeah. Thank you. Should I pop it on? Yeah. A specimen found on Paddy's local beach in 1840 by Mary Anning of a pterosaur, a flying reptile, is being studied today by engineers. People who are interested in biomechanics and the construction of things like aeroplanes, structures that have to be strong but still able to retain lightness. And the pterosaur skeleton is a perfect natural example of that. So we've got people doing cutting edge scientific work on what makes the bones of pterosaurs so light yet strong enough to enable the animal to have flown. Wow, and so the Natural History Museum is looking to the future and that is why we keep these collections. What's amazing is that the research that's being undertaken here on fossils that are millions of years old is having an impact on how we live today and even on our future. With wife Ricky suggesting Paddy streamlines his collection to generate a bit of cash, I've invited them to London for inspiration at Spitalfields Market. I'm certainly not knocking your shop in Lyme Regis. Right. <laughs> well, what I'm going to propose is perhaps thinking about new markets. Right. So perhaps taking the fossils out of Lyme Regis and bringing them to a place and an audience who might not have seen the types of things you have right. and the quality that you have. Right. And perhaps presenting them maybe less to collectors, but more to people who appreciate and love their visual appeal okay. and see them as decorative items. This market is a great place to start because it sells decorative art and antiques. The trouble is, I know Paddy is reluctant to sell. But don't you think, Paddy, that you could easily see fossils being sold here decoratively? I could see someone else's fossils being sold here, absolutely, yeah. Someone else's? <laughs> Perhaps if I introduce him to someone who runs a stall here, it might help. Aidan sells quirky artefacts and curiosities. I've got to introduce you to Paddy. Hello. Hi. Pleased to meet you. And Ricky. Hi, Aidan. Hello there. Hi, Aidan. Nice to meet you. So how do you think fossils would sell here? Is it the sort of thing you might find buyers for readily and easily? I have sold fossils before, just yeah. really for their decorative value. Um, I think perhaps less serious scientific side, uh, right. more things that would look so a bit spectacular. More architectural sort of, sort of thing. Uh, definitely. You've brought some fossils with you, haven't you? Yeah, I've got a few things in my, in my bag. Um, well, should we show them Exciting. to Aidan? Yeah. Yeah. Get his opinion. Yeah, yeah. 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 Oh, yes. oh, wow. So is that the sort of thing? Yes. I mean, that was a reaction and a half. <laughs> That's absolutely gorgeous. You see, what I'd like to do is mount that on yeah. a stand. Well, yeah, what you would do is just get a plain wooden base or even just a plain stone base, drill it here uh, and just pop it on a spike, and then it's ready to go. It's ready to put on someone's mantelpiece. I mean, I think it's beautiful as is, but just like that tiny bit of extra effort will definitely make just it into the, just finish off, an right? item. Is this sounding like something you might consider? You Come and join us. Do you need to sit down? <laughs> <laughs> But we've already decided that there are some things that you'd be happier 
would that be fair to say happier to sell? Uh, yeah, yeah, some things I wouldn't, I wouldn't mind, um, but the, the sort of core of my collection I would never Never no. You don't know how big a step that is. <laughs> Are we making progress, <laughs> do you think? so. Are we still married? <laughs> <laughs> For today. <laughs> I hope I've given Paddy some inspiration here today. After 40 years of fossil hunting, it's probably time for Paddy to think about moving on some of his collection. After you, please. And it's time for me to reveal how much his collection is worth. The collection as a whole. We've had it valued, and he feels that if you were to offer the collection for sale by auction, it would fetch somewhere in the region of... Fifty and eighty thousand pounds. Oh my gosh! <laughs> Shoes for the children. <laughs> <laughs> if I divorce you now, do I get a half? <laughs> Does it make you feel any differently about your collection and your work so far? No, no. Actually, I mean, probably the most valuable things will, will never be sold. Um, so the collection will maintain most of its value. But there is a lot of chaff, a lot of little things of which I have many specimens which, which can almost certainly go. But you can see yourself parting with some of it now? Yes. I think I can call that a result. Thank you, Ricky. Next time, I visit a world record-breaking collection. Yes. A lot <laughs> of stuff! My goodness. I meet a lady dedicated to preserving the past. It's a way of life, how people live, that has gone. And we unveil a hidden gem. My collection is Hull's best-kept secret. This is <laughs> unbelievable! Nothing goes to waste over on BBC One now. Cooking with leftovers is the challenge on MasterChef. You'll need a sensitive stomach here. We're overrun by cockroaches. Send for the pest detectives. Over 60 British women some as young as 15 have travelled to Syria to join IS. They maybe went in search for a better life. In the Middle East, hundreds of thousands of Christians have fled Islamist forces. You're finding people who love death more than you love life. Through a highly organised system, IS amassed a $2 billion war chest. BBC Two reveals the secrets of the world's most dangerous terror army. Continues with Kill the Christians, tonight at 9 on BBC Two. You've been telling us you want to know more about what might happen after the election, particularly if there is a hung parliament. Tomorrow we'll try and answer your questions. Join us BBC Two, BBC News Channel and online from 9.15. Now on BBC Two, I tend to watch this show through my fingers. Who knows what...